and friends, colleagues, um, Professor Dao. And uh, we just, uh, our first acquaintance was the year 2006, right? When we first have a nano, uh, what's a nanotechnology center for uh, smart textile and a function. Functional and intelligent textile. Yeah, that that time, uh, Professor Dao was one of the key researchers on smart self cleaning like technology. I, I remember, and here we also have other colleagues. And that. now I needed to give a proper introduction of apart from the history. Um, professor Dao is a professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the CTU. And he graduated from Austria, University of Technology, Graz, with a combined BS and MS degree in chemical engineering, and received his PhD in UK uh, in the area of flexible bilayer photovoltaic cells. Um, that's a Sheffield University, right? Sheffield. Hmm. His research uh, currently is mainly focused in the area of energy harvesting and a smart wearable technology uh, area very close to our research institute. And uh, today he will give you some highlight of his recent research, I think. And uh, we, we are really indeed uh, delighted to, to hear you accept the invitation and give us a talk. And uh, here, uh, I think uh, the young students and also young researchers will benefit from your journey. Thank you. And uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Professor Tao, for the introduction. Um, I'm also honored to be here and give a talk. Um, you know, uh, CTU is only two, two stops away by uh, East Trail. So I'm, I'm not that far away from you. Um, okay, um, so yes, um, you, you heard a little bit about my background. Just to add that I did my PhD in uh, flexible solar cells. Uh, that was started in 1997, but at that time there wasn't not much interest in solar energy in general. Uh, fossil fuels were fine at that time. Pricing didn't shoot to the roof the way they do now. Um, no such energy-related conflicts that we see at the moment in Europe. So yeah, at that time, there wasn't much interest. Um, and after my PhD, my first academic postdoctoral position were at PolyU, and I worked with Professor Tao at that time as well. Uh, some, aspe some aspect uh, even prior to the uh, to the establishment of the nano of the uh, the nano center is that what it used to call yeah. nanotechnology center nanotechnology center that's right yeah so even prior to that we also had the work on conductive textiles uh, with uh, Professor uh, uh, Bin at that time as well uh, Shin Bin right and also uh, uh, Fei Bin too um, so yeah so we uh, so I've started, continued that research on flexible uh, devices, if you like, since my PhD. Um, then after that, I left uh, ODU and that was to immigrate to Australia, to Monash University, um, for a few reasons. At that time, it was SARS. At the beginning, it was SARS. And later, there were air, air pollution in Hong Kong. So we decided to immigrate. But then... In 2012, during that time between 2007 when I left Australia, um, during that time we used to come back every Christmas, and the weather usually in Hong Kong is very good. I mean, so for whatever reason, so no problem with air pollution. Um, so we think it's time to come back. Um, and when I get the uh, invitation from from CTU, there was a new department called the School of Energy and Environment. So I thought that's something good. Um, something new, there would be new courses, there are things that you can explore new. So we made the move back to Hong Kong. Um, and uh, yeah, and I've been ever since uh, at, at CityU. Okay, so uh, my topic today relates to wearable 
and self-powered. So I just want to put few underlines um, at the self-power because that will be the main focus of my talk today. And then I will end up talking about the applications of these, uh, of these devices. But the self-power feature, it's really the main theme of my talk today. Yeah. Okay, so the uh, just a brief outline. Uh, I'll start with background. Uh, why we're focusing on self-power? What is the rationale behind that? And then I'll talk about the key transduction concepts that are used in this uh, self-power feature of these devices. Uh, we'll talk about specific examples uh, in terms of first we start with the energy harvesting component. Yeah, of as a feature of these devices, and then we move on to talk about their applications as self-powered sensors. Yeah, mainly focusing on applications such as e-skin, um, as well as um, a number of sensors of environment, sensor of pressure, motion, etc. So we'll come to that at the end of the topic, and then we'll have some conclusion as well as some prospects uh, into the future of this research. Um, now, the first uh, the first reason behind what we do, um, there are two reasons. Uh, the first, in terms of the big picture concept, the energy crisis. Yeah, uh, and this is a fact, and will continue uh, to grow as a problem. So, therefore, we need to find solution. But let's define the issue with, um, with, with energy. There is no doubt that today there is an urgent need to grow energy supply from renewable resources, right? Uh, because with the rising energy demand, um, using energy, relying on energy from depleting um, and also polluting uh, fossil fuels alone wouldn't be sufficient. So just relying in the future on fossil fuels alone, that wouldn't be sufficient to meet the rising energy demand. That's Now, the second thing is that renewable energy resources also bore far less impact on climate change, air pollution, and all of these environmental effects. Um, so therefore, there is a need to find some solutions. There will no be, um, th th certainly there won't be a, a one big fix solution to the energy crisis, that's for sure. But it will take an array of solutions to help with that. Now you know that uh, Hong Kong they have uh, they established the uh, the carbon emission reduction target. So by 2030, the plan is to reach 60 to uh, 65 to 70 percent reduction in carbon emission. That's by 2030, and by 2050, we should Hong Kong should reach carbon neutrality means uh, zero carbon emission. So if if we really were to achieve these uh, more or less aggressive uh, target reduction, by all means, you can call them ambitious, but they are there for a reason. So if we were to achieve such ambitious carbon reduction targets, then we certainly need to increase the proportion, the proportion of renewable energy in the fuel mix for electricity generation in Hong Kong. We need to start increasing the proportion of renewable energy in the fuel mix of uh, for uh, for fuel for for Hong Kong electricity generation. 
Okay, so we talked about the first issue is the carbon emission and uh, and the associated environmental effects. The second problem, again, toward the driving force while we're doing this research. The second is the uh, probably a problem that we all experience firsthand is that when you when your mobile phone runs out of power and you need it most at that point. So, so therefore, it's, well, one on one hand, we certainly need to find, we rely more on renewable energy sources. But when it comes to small electronics, uh, the first thing we should do is to try to improve the the efficiency of the devices, make them lower energy consumption. But the second point here, we want to also ensure that they can operate continuously. That means they should have self-power function. Yeah. So two aspects here. So therefore, um, as I said, to add, one of the proposed solutions to these problems is to try to harvest energy from the ambience, yeah? So let's talk about the energy of the ambience. But before we do that, let's talk about the renewable energies and what's available. Now, if you look at uh, solar, biomass, hydropower, geothermal, ocean energy, wind energy, et cetera, now, this, to be able to convert to these types of renewable energy, you need a large apparatus, a large device. For instance, if you want to convert solar energy meaningfully, then you need solar panels. Those panels, you see them on uh, the roof of some buildings in Hong Kong. So you certainly need a large device to do that. Now, the same thing goes for biomass, geothermal, hydropower, they all require power plants, uh, whether it is biomass. Uh, and the, this type of power, uh, power plants, we call them thermomechanical devices, devices that convert the fuel energy to thermal energy and then to mechanical energy to rotate a shaft inside a magnet so that you can generate electricity. So this is known as thermomechanical devices, but again, they are also large in size. Now I said that the, the what we pro propose as a solution uh, to address those two problems, large problems that I talked about before, to add, one of the proposed solutions is to harvest the energy of the environment, right? We call it ambient energy. Now, one of the one of the most available ambient energy is mechanical energy, yeah, motion. These are usually lost, wasted. Um, but if we can, we can harvest it. We can make some contribution to the problems I've just talked about. But let's talk about the features of this type of energy. Certainly, it is weak. It is small in magnitude. Yeah. Uh, it's also variable in terms of frequency. So it goes from low to high and from high to low. It's high, highly variable in terms of frequency. It's also affected the harvesting of such a small mechanical energy of the ambience. Uh, it's also affected by the environment conditions, such as humidity, temperature, et cetera. So the, if we were really to make use of the energy of the ambience, then we need to produce devices that are first, have to be small. We cannot use large device to harvest a small energy, right? So they need to be small. Uh, second, they need to be adaptable to different frequencies, 
low and high frequency. The energy of the uh, mechanical energy of the environment mainly mainly low uh, low frequency in any way. Uh, but they also need to be adaptable to the different environmental conditions, such as humidity, as an example, living in Hong Kong. Yeah. Okay, so that gives a brief introduction of why we're doing what we're doing. So let's talk about the transduction concept that we use in these devices to harvest the energy of the ambience. Now, the first concept, and I'm specifically focusing on mechanical energy. The first is piezoelectric concept. And I think the concept many of you uh, working in the, uh, in the research institute are aware, certainly you'll be uh, familiar with the concept. So I won't, won't be, uh, we won't go into details. Uh, it's just that it's a, it's a piezoelectricity is a property uh, associated with a certain class of materials uh, that have uh, non central symmetric uh, feature, yeah, in terms of its structure, yeah. So uh, they mainly polycrystalline as a result, and they can be they can be liquid, they can be solid, uh, they can be organic, they can be inorganic. There's a range of substances that have this feature. And it all comes down because of this polycrystallinity feature and non-central uh, symmetric feature is that they have they made of dipoles. So these dipoles certainly are polarized, so the positive and negative dipoles. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, as you can see here from the drawing, uh, upon compression, these dipoles start to align. So Negative will go on one side, positive on the other, and if you have, if you attach a a, a current col a charge collector to either side, then obviously these charges that generate the what we call them polarization charges, then induce the opposite charge in the con in the current collector. Yeah, so then energy then will start to flow in the external circuit uh, as a result of that. Okay, the other concept is the tribal concept, uh, the tribal electric concept. And the tribal electric concept is it's a very common, we all know that. Um, for instance, when you rub a balloon against your hair, now a balloon is made of an artificial or synthetic elastomer, yeah, known as, as a siloxane elastomer, which is Tribal negative, i.e., it has the tendency. It has the tendency to donate electrons or give away electrons. And your hair is the opposite. Your hair made of keratins, uh, which is a a class of proteins. And keratins have the tendency to lose electrons, so that we call them tribal positive. Yeah, to lose one two. Um, uh, to gain electrons, one to gain, uh, uh, give up on the electrons. So therefore, combining these two, that means by rubbing the balloon against your hair, then you have induced tribal charge. Yeah. So that means the interaction, because there are charges on the balloon and the charges on your hair that are opposite. After a few rubs, when you move your balloon away from your hair, then your hair follow the balloon. So kind of stand up. And that's because of the electrostatic uh, interaction between the induced tribal charges. So by, by the same concept, uh, so if we have again, similar to the concept of balloon and your hair, tribal versus tribal negative, if we utilize that concept, we can also harvest the induced tribal charges. Um, and when you when you make a device that is based on the tribal electric effect, essentially what you do, you're really not only harvesting tribal charge, but you also harvest electrostatic charge. Believe it or not, every service that we have, every surface around you, yeah, from the seats to the pinched tables to your clothes, every surface, it's either tribal positive or tribal negative. And in addition to that, there are 
charges on that surface, what we call them electrostatic charges. Yeah. So there are charges are everywhere. So what you do here, if you make a device to gen what we call it a tribal electric generator, but remember when I said before, if you were to do it for harvesting a small amount of energy, then you needed to have a small device. So the word here, nano generator, doesn't really mean a nano sized device, but it means compared with a power plant, it's a very small in size. So it's just a, a reference to a small device. Doesn't necessarily mean it's made of a nano size device. It has nothing to do with that. Just I give an example. Uh, when you talk about, uh, I was in, in, in Singapore in 2019 and I visited the electrical engineering department. I gave a talk in a conference uh, at the same, in the same visit. But they were talking to me about the nano grid. I said nano grid. What is a nano grid? You know the grid, the, the one that connects all of us. Yeah. Uh, for Hong Kong, Hong Kong is connected to a grid plus other uh, uh, two or three cities connected to the same grid. So if something happens to that grid, obviously we'll have a blackout, everybody. But the idea of the grid is the is the central is the central unit that basically supply electricity to everyone connected to that grid. So, but they talking talk to me about nanogrid. I said nanogrid. Well, what is a nanogrid? It turns out to be if you have, and obviously there must be a microgrid too. If you have a nanogrid, then there is a microgrid, and there is a, I haven't heard about milligrid, but there is microgrid and there is nanogrid. I haven't heard about milligrid yet. So the idea of microgrid is to serve, it's not entire city, but to serve a district of a city. This is known as a microgrid. I said, so what about nanogrid? It serves as a building, just a single building. Then it's known as nanogrid. So the word nano here doesn't mean anything in terms of dimensions. It has nothing to do with dimensions. It just is a size, is a relative size uh, word that is used. Okay, so just to clarify this. Because at the beginning when I worked in these uh, so-called nano generators, I insisted not calling them nano generators, just call them generators. And then I was told, yes, it's not, it has nothing to do with, it's just a size. So please change it from generator to non-generator, whether it is the editor or the, the reviewers. And I was quite a stubborn. I shouldn't call, it, call them nano-generator at that time. But later I knew what the word nano means. Yeah. Okay, uh, so let's, let's move on. Let's talk about some examples of those wearable energy harvesters that we make, the so-called nano generators. Yeah. Now, the first thing we did, uh, that is back in 2015, when we started this research. Uh, sorry, we started in 2014, but in particular in 2015, one of the things that we started with was the piezoelectric effect. And in around the time of 2012, publications start to emerge on not piezo nanogenerators, but tribal nanogenerators. So as tribal gen nanogenerators start to emerge at that time, started from 2012. And by Ling Wang, I'm sure many of you know about this name, this scientist in Georgia Tech. And now 50%, I think, in China <laughs> have joined appointments with the uh, Beijing Institute of Energy. So he, um, the, this, this scientist, uh, Zhong Lin Wang, he basically looked at uh, an old concept, tribal electricity. I mentioned this tribal charge, just like the, the first human, when they wanted to have fire, how did they manage to have fire? They rub, they rub stones against each other, right? 
until there is sufficient number of charge that then using a leaf from a tree so that leaves once exposed to this charge would then catch fire so the concept tribal electricity existed ever since human existed but it hasn't really made any uh, buzz or or noise or anything the for what for what for single reason is that when fossil fuels are abundant and burning them is not an issue then why we should care about such a small amount of a charge that exists on surfaces or we can induce them we know we call them tribal charge why we should bother with such a small amount of charge and that's the concept before but now there is an renowned interest i mentioned the two reasons behind this and uh, so therefore uh, therefore we started at, at similar time first we start with piezo we knew about the energy that you can harvest is very small but i was then in, i attended a conference and uh, zonling wang was giving a talk uh, i think it's 2014 in london and he was saying that the tribal electricity, the magnitude of tribal electricity in terms of a scale is at the same scale as electromagnetic induction. You know, electromagnetic induction is the way we get electricity from here in Hong Kong, right? And all around the world. The concept of, again, I mentioned before, the conversion from thermal, from, from fuel energy, yeah, chemical form, to thermal, to mechanical, that's known as electromagnetic induction. This concept is predominantly used today to, to generate electricity. So he was saying that tribal electricity is in the same magnitude if properly utilized, so electromagnetic induction. So I was intrigued by that. And he, he showed in that, in that talk, he showed many devices and uh, many videos that showing devices that can uh, um can turn on and off a car um, you know when you have a, the remote control so they take the battery away from the remote control and just a, a device that they just uh, did some form of tapping on that device they collected some energy that is enough to turn off and on a car uh, power uh, a digital display um, like a smart watch they have showed they showed many of these videos so it's quite impressive and uh he I, I knew the the seat next to me was occupied someone is occupying that seat but turned it out to be the seat of john lin wang so after he finished the seminar he came and sat next to me and then i see him taking out his laptop to use and i thought his laptop must be self-powered right from mechanical energy harvesting then the next thing he did, he's connected the charger, the adapter of the charger, and the seats have PowerPoint, so connected. I told him, oh, you still use the conventional charger for your laptop? He said, yes, yes, not yet, not yet, not yet. We're not yet there. Then at that time, we just had a laugh. Um, so, but again, at that time, I came back and I talked to my student and I said, well, tribal electricity should be the way to go not piezo electricity but nevertheless you can have certainly a hybrid device yeah a hybrid device to to of the two right not necessarily relying only on tribal since it has larger magnitude compared with the piezo generators that we make which reduces very little current so we think okay well uh, the first in a sense that we use piezo electric effect for not for nano generators, but I'm just showing you here as an example where it is utilized to improve the efficiency of solar cell. Now, this solar cell combines the com the com uh, the concept of photoelectric or photovoltaic, as well as the concept of piezoelectric, known as piezo phototronic effect. So we utilize that uh, in the sense of uh, when you make a, a flexible device, then naturally that device will experience bending, rolling, some form 
of mechanical deformation from its original uh, straight stage. So what happens here we, when we, um, uh, you know, in a, in a, in similar to what I did in my PhD, you make a device, a flexible device, then you need the synthesizer, the, the substance that give up electrons, and you also need the electron acceptor substance, right? The one that can harvest those, those charge. So naturally, we use metal oxide, in my PhD at least, I use metal oxide as the electron acceptor. So here we use the, the kind of electron acceptor that's commonly used in organic solar cells, which is uh, zinc oxide. Now, if you use zinc oxide in conjunction with an organic solar cell or an organic donor of electrons, because this is a solar cell, so it operates by light. Now, zinc oxide is also known as a photocatalyst that generate oxidants. So therefore, oxidants hurt the organic sensitizer. So this is very well known. And over time, that reduces the lifetime of the organic sensitizer. That means reduces the lifetime of the solar cell. So that's that was known as an issue. So what we did here, we were really after just changing the, at the interface between the sensitizer and the electron acceptor, we changed from zinc oxide to zinc sulfide. Doesn't have photocatalysis uh, or photocatalytic properties. So that means we can protect the perovskite from photooxidation by zinc oxide. Yeah, I'll come to, uh, to the, uh, photocatalysis later on, uh, that because it's related to the um, to the self-cleaning work we've done uh, at PolyU before. So, uh, so the interface now is zinc sulfide. So we protected the organic sensitizer, but the zinc sulfide did something else. It also modulates uh, the energy bands or the energy levels, what we call it, the band structure at the interface. It modulates it in a way that makes charge extraction from perovskites more efficient. So here are two reasons to improve the performance. Now, the, the, the last reason, which basically, these are mainly to improve the extraction as well as stability. But the main reason for the increase of, uh, of PCE is when you bend the device, then you're not only harvesting the photocharge, you also harvest tribocharge, yeah, from the bending. Uh, it's, sorry, in this case, it's a polarization charge, it's piezo charge. Sorry, there is no contact and separation um, other than bending. So here it's it's only piezo charge, what we call them polarization charge. So here with the help of this polarization charge that happens with bending, and you can see here, if we go from zero strain, yeah, no, no curving yeah, of, the, uh, of the device, then all the way to 2% strain, uh, that means we change the curvature, uh, the diameter or the radius of the curvature. Uh, so as you do that, you increases, of course, the strain. So you go just from zero to 2%, and you can see here, there is change in the PCE uh, or the change of uh, power conversion efficiency. Uh, this is known the IV curve, very char characteristic uh, for, uh, for solar, solar cell performance evaluation. And you can see here at uh, particularly 1.5 strain, then you get an increase uh, from zero uh, in terms of current. So we went from around 22, um, uh, uh, 22 milliamp per cm square, 22 milliamp C, uh, in terms of current density from 22 uh, to 24. So that increases the conversion efficiency. Yeah. And therefore uh, we managed to get a conversion efficiency around 15% from 13%. So that's significant increase in percentage just by bending the device. 
I, uh, I talked about the concept of piezo charge, tribal charge, et cetera. And you can make devices, energy harvesters based on this concept. And I also talked about that P, uh, the amount of tribal charge are far more, far more than piezo charge or polarization charge. That's very well known. But what wasn't known at that point, if you have a device that made of substances that have both piezo and tribal properties, yeah, what is the contribution of each effect in a hybrid device in terms of the ratio of the piezoelectric volt that you get as well as the triboelectric volt? What's the ratio of these two? We know that we should have far greater voltage coming from the tribal effect compared with the piezo effect. We knew that, right? But what is the exact ratio? What is the contribution of each? That wasn't known when we started this research. So we thought, okay, well, let's try to make a device. Um, for tribal, uh, as I mentioned before, I didn't show you the video that we have two, uh, two, uh, two substances, one tribal negative, one tribal positive, and you keep uh, contact and maintaining contact and separation. Then you get induced charge and these charges start to flow in the external circuit as soon as the divide, the, the substances separate. So the concept of contact and separation is important. Therefore, you need to have a physical gap in the device, a distance between the two substances, right? So that you can do contact and separation. So the concept of having a physical gap, what we call it a physical spacer, is important for tribal electricity. Then, and of course, here we are after understanding the contribution of each effect. So we divide, we design a composite that is made of both tribal and um, uh, and, and piezo effects, uh, this composite. And we made four devices out of it. Two, um, the, uh, two devices with a spacer, two without a spacer. So that means they can only operate as a piezoelectric generator. If you eliminate the spacer, yeah, then there's no more contact and separation. And the other is uh, with and without uh, zinc oxide. So basically, they, you don't have the uh, you don't have the piezoelectric component that enhances the piezoelectric effect of PVDF. And then what we we were able to do by an, by analyzing the output of these devices, then we were able to set, to uh, to work out the contribution, you see the output of each device, of the four devices. And of course, the highest one was the one with a spacer, of course, and ZNO as the piezoelectric component. So that device for sure gave us the highest, right? But, but analy by analyzing the output of the four devices, then we managed to uh, identify the contribution of each effect in our device. As you can see here, is 13 to 1, yeah? The contribution of the tribal effect is 13 to the piezo potential, yeah? The tribal potential is three, 13 times that of uh, the piezo potential. So we can now quant quantify the contribution of each. And uh, what you can see here, um, my student who also worked uh, in Professor Tao's lab after graduation for a while. Um, he's wearing the device on his wrist. The sizes are similar to a watch size. And basically just walking. And then we can calculate the output it's just to demonstrate uh, this uh, in a video. I don't know whether I can play the video or not. But, uh, but you can see the change of output with the every footstep uh, made. So what I am talking about here, I've been talking about energy harvesting, yeah? Energy harvesting. Now, if you, if you recall the signal that we get 
from a mechanical input, it is already in response to an input. That means, um, just to just before I get into the concept of sensors, uh, now moving from energy harvesting to self-powered sensors, just before going in that, that particular work was then capture the attention of an editor in the in South China Morning Post and asked me to provide more information. So we we had some discussion and was then featured on the uh, in an article on in 2017. But the article itself uh, was published in 2016, end of 2016, and it also featured on the cover page of the uh, of the journal. It was published in. Okay, just before move, moving to talk about concept, uh, the concept of uh, self-powered sensors, just one more a piece of a study that we have found. Again, it was purely accidental results. Uh, I mentioned that we worked before on self-cleaning textiles. And I've, we started, of course, with cotton, we moved to wool. And then uh, when I joined CTU in 2012, then I start looking at Kashmir. Of course, we couldn't touch Kashmir at the beginning of the research because Kashmir is a luxurious fiber and uh, very difficult to handle. Um, so any small things that you can do to Kashmir immediately change its properties. So it's not something we could definitely start with in the self-cleaning treatment that we did to, uh, to other fibers or fabrics. So we had a project at that time. Uh, that work was published in 2018. At that time, we had a, a project to turn Kashmir self-cleaning using indoor lights, uh, indoor. So we have many Kashmir samples laying around. They come from Kashmir sweaters as well as Kashmir yarns in our lab. But uh, what, the, what the researcher that, do that, that did that work noticed is that as part of the treatment to impart self-cleaning function, we need to clean Kashmir, right? Before we do anything to it. And part of that cleaning is using detergents. And for Kashmir, because it's so delicate, we use non-ionic detergents. But uh, what the researcher found is that the surface properties, and in particular, the surface charge density of Kashmir changes significantly based on the detergent we use. Significant change in charge, uh, in, uh, sur uh, in surface charge density, which is interesting. Now, Kashmir, I mentioned, is also made of keratins. I mentioned human hair. So Kashmir is no difference. It's also made of keratin. So it's also tribal positive, but that the level of surface charge density is far greater depending on what kind of solvent you use or what kind of detergent uh, or cleaning agent that you use. Then with this, when we notice this, then there is also impact on these, um, the surface dielectric properties too, because surface dielectric properties also related to surface charge density. Then we set out the work, okay, well, let's understand what's going on and uh, work out the reason why there is impact on surface charge density based on these different uh, reagents that we use. So we had, uh, we had two, basically four groups, uh, two groups, um, uh, polar, uh, a polar group and two are non-polar, the other group ionic and non-ionic. So uh, 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 different classes of of detergents, if you like, to do the, the cleaning of Kashmir and look at the impact so that we can understand what is the, what's the role of this effect and on the surface charge density. And we made different devices. So we, we managed to link the, the nature of the substance that used to treat to the, uh, to the, to the, to the, uh, to surface charge density as well as dielectric property. Uh, of Kashmir, but but essentially the device itself is a very very simple. Uh, so you can look at it here. 
Um, it's just a, a sandwich device. This is essentially the cashmere that we use uh, from for the selfie cleaning project. No change is exactly the same. Uh, we just uh, coupled it with uh, Teflon, a Teflon layer, and a sandwich between top and bottom electrodes or current collectors. So that's uh, the device is very, very simple. And the conversion, the power density that we could get from that device uh, was is, uh, 40 milliwatt per meter square. That's not very high power density by any means. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's good enough to power LEDs, etc. Uh, so you can see also the char the charge uh, the charge density is also low, uh, sixteen micro coulomb per meter square. That's relatively low charge density as well. Uh, the device was a stable. One of the things we worried about is what once you do the treatment is that it the the treatment effect on surface charge density is this, uh, um, uh, is it a time dependent effect? meaning that over time you lose that enhanced charge, self-charge density. Uh, it turns out to be, it is a, a stable. So you see that the same device meant after 25 days can still produce the same uh, tribal voltage or open circuit voltage. Okay, so that's uh, one link to from the self-cleaning work to the uh, to the energy harvesting work. Now this work featured on the cover page of the of the uh, of the journal. But most important thing is that these these energy harvesters, yeah, they can produce a small uh, current or small electric color current, but that is small. Don't uh, don't just uh, dismiss it because it's it's good enough to power small low power consumption devices. Uh, and that's how Zonlin Wang has been producing all these videos, right? Uh, even a, a car remote control can also be done. Uh, but as I said before, these harvesters have also potential application in motion sensing. Since you get a signal based on motion, right? So you should be able to use them, to use that signal. Um, either in using resistive or capacitive signal. But essentially, you don't need power to power such a sensor. So that means we can turn them into self-powered sensors. So let's talk about, I'll talk only about two examples, um, two, uh, two work, yeah, uh, two pieces of work that we did, uh, and I'll try to speed up. Um, the first is that now, if you were to make a wearable self-powered sensor, it's essentially is the, the the sensor is essentially the energy harvester. It's just it's, it's not used to harvest energy, but rather sense pressure or motion or arm bending or finger bending, etc. So in this case, you know very well that if the material uh, doesn't have sufficient mechanical properties, then hysteresis will start build up. So when you bend it, deformation take place. So it doesn't go back to its original shape. That means there will always a change of displacement of the material. So we wanted to make something that is flexible, but low mechanical hysteresis. So one of the issues about the devices as well that we made, I show you that the uh, the mechanic, the, the cashmere based tribal generators, we had copper, we had aluminum top and bottom electrodes. So we had metal electrodes, that's what I want to get at. But one of the issues here on something wearable you need to think of getting away with the metal electrode. At the end of the day, the level of conductivity is good enough given the level of charge that you're harvesting. So something like uh, something like a polyionic uh, hydrogel, for instance, 
that will give you the flexibility you need being a semi-solid. And you can use it as current collector. Now, of course, uh, with the one which we, the particular polyionic hydrogel we use, we also use it as a tribal material too in the device. So, but then we reduce our reliance on metal electrodes just to simplify, to make it more, uh, more compatible with closing. So you use this, um, one of the one of the problems with hydrogel, of course, polyionic hydrogel is known to be a good ionic conductor. But one of the problems with them is that, of course, they they lose water by through evaporation, and uh, or through water leakage from the hydrogel, and both of them will lead to reduction in its um, ionic conductivity. So. The other thing that we wanted to do, we wanted to make it transparent, yeah, so that you can use it for your skin if you like. So you can put it in your skin, but you cannot tell it is there, just from a physicistic point of view. So we uh, we made this uh, this uh, this hydrogel, um, and the idea is to first make it tran transparent, and the idea is to prevent the hydrogel from losing its water contents to maintain its ionic conductivity. And when we, um, and this, by the way, this device is, we call it single electrode. So you only need to rely on a single tribal substance. Uh, it's just a, um, a single electrode device. Uh, so we, we, we sandwich the, uh, the hydrogel um, and just encapsulated in PDMS, and we put a thing, a wire to connect uh, that material. And you can see the overall device is uh, is transparent. Um, and we did characterization. So certainly the the uh, the power output that we get from this device. Uh, so here, what you see is the vo the open circuit voltage, the short circuit current, as well as the surface charge. And then take it, take the device size into account. Then we can calculate the charge density as well as the power density. So the power density of this device is uh, is two. Well, you can act two point eight watt per meter square. So that's significant improvement compared with the cashmere based device yeah uh, that only had 0.5 micro uh, sorry uh, po uh, 0.5 uh, milliwatt per meter square maybe i forgot to mention the power density of that device it was 0.5 milliwatt per meter square so that that's significant improvement in output in this device Uh, what we did also, and of course we proved that you don't need a metal electrode. Uh, the, uh, the 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 tribal positive layer of uh, PVA PEI, which is our hydrogel uh, in water, is an effective current collector. So you don't need a metal electrode. We also tried to make a larger device. The device this device is uh, is three by three cm. So this device here is ten by ten, and we also made it on. Uh, on glass, so you can see the transparencies here on the device, on the slightly larger device. So in terms of scaling, it also can be scaled. Now I will finish with this study, um, and then we'll go through the conclusion and prospect. Um, now as an extension of flexible devices, and it, when, especially when it comes to hysteresis, then flexible substance is not good enough. Yeah, over time, hysteresis will start to build up. And uh, even with the hydrogel that we just talked about. So the idea here is to make something that is stretchable, basically, and at the same time, ionic conductor. So the concept of replacing metal is still there. Uh, it's just that we're not using hydrogel here. We're using an ionic elastomer. And the ionic elastomers, by nature, they are insulators. So only with the concept of introducing ionic liquids, uh, basically, it's an elastomer that encapsulates. 
yeah, that encapsulate ionic liquids in them. So basically what you're creating inside the device, you're creating a, a double layer capacitor within your elastomer. That gives it its, its uh, ionic conductivity. And being an elastomer, of course, it is stretchable. And the concept involved at that interface of the capaci uh, the double layer capacitor concept uh, between the elastomeric substance and the ionic liquids. Uh, so they basically we, we draw this to, to show the interactions at the interface. And of course the mechanical properties in terms of stretchability. And here we, we, uh, we try to measure the adhesion to a sub to different substrates, uh, because at that point of time we still don't have the concept of sensor or generator yet, um, or self power sensor. So we're trying to look at the adhesion uh, force uh, to different substrates. Now it's quite important to have this because essentially this is your current collector, so it needs to have a very good contact with your uh, tribal electric counterpart. Uh, so in order to, just to understand, so this is essentially what we use, that's the device. It's not really to measure uh, the out, uh, the uh, uh, electrical output, but only to measure the gauge factor, i.e. the sensitivity of the device. So back to the uh, motion sensor, yeah? Or what we call the strain sensor, yeah? So this device is basically, it's our strain sensor. And what we did, you apply strain from zero to 150% a strain. And you can see the change in the, uh, what we call the change in the um, uh, resistance. Yeah. The, the difference in the resistance, the change in the difference in the resistance uh, versus resistance will give us uh, the ratio, what we call it the gauge factor. So anyway, if you look at that resistance change, uh, you can see it is linear, there is linear. So here we just take out this point and uh, put it against strain. So you can see there is linear relationship. Yeah. So as you stretch, the resistance increases. Yeah. yeah you stretch more, resistance increase more, et cetera. Yeah. So we made it into... A, uh, and we wanted to measure the stability, how long it can go, uh, because remember, it's about reducing hysteresis. So stability uh, over a number of cycles is important. Uh, and here we, we look at, not in terms of resistive behavior, here we look at the device in terms of capacitive behavior, but also we need to look at the, uh, the gauge factor, uh, et cetera, as well as the stability over a number of cycles at the start as well as the end. We did for resist, resistive, as a resistive strain sensor, we did that for uh, 2,500 cycle uh, seconds. Uh, for the capacitive, we did it for, I think a similar number of seconds. Um, but uh, but we, what we did here, we chose a, a certain number of cycles at the, at the start and at the end so that we can compare the change in the output whether it's capacitive or resistive output. Um, now, as a, as a, as a sensor, uh, when it comes to resistive sensing, uh, you can see here the change in gauge factor versus uh, temperature as a, as a, not as a strain sensor here, as a, as a term temperature sensor. Uh, you can see here, it's not a linear relationship, yeah? in fact, is a trimodal relationship. So you can see here the slope, the drop in in uh, in resistance is quite sharp in this region here between 20 to 60 uh, degrees Celsius, between 60 uh, to um, around 100 degree Celsius. You can see that the, uh, the, the drop is uh, less sharp. So larger, uh, lower slope. And then here, uh, there's another regime which is more or less, even less change in resistance. 
So therefore, but you can still work out the temperature, equivalent temperature to each of these three regions as a sensor. So the idea here and compare ourselves with literature sensors uh, in terms of both the, uh, the level of a strain, so it can go up to 140%, as well as the, uh, as well as the, uh, the gauge factor itself, what we call it sensitivity. Um, uh, in this work, we, we wanted to make a device, obviously energy harvester, but this is not so much of interest. And uh, in the sake of time, I'll just skip, go to the, uh, the last slide. Uh, we just wanted to turn that into an array of sensors. Yeah. For instance, something that recognizes the human if you poke someone, with a, how 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 good the signal is. So we made a device that's based on four by four sensors. There's sixteen sensors, and uh, and basically they are sandwiched again um, uh, in eco flex, top and bottom. And then we basically deliberately use the finger to poke this particular sensor in the device, which is device two from left to right and two from top to bottom. So this device two, two device is the one that give us this sharp signal. Uh, mind you, the nearby devices also show us signal too, because they also affected by the touch. And remember, based on the resolution, in terms of how many sensor uh, as an array per, per, uh, per cm square, then you can cal then obviously the the sensitivity uh, will increase, and also the impact on na na uh, neighboring uh, devices will also be impacted. But you can see clearly here the impact on this two by two is quite recognizable uh, from the touch. Yeah. Here is the touch on hand, so that you can see the device here, by the way, uh, it's on, on someone's hand. Um, so we can demonstrate uh, in a number of sensors. In fact, one, one characterization we didn't do, not just uh, temperature, but we also uh, looked at the impact of temperature on the, the, the signal that we get. So it can work as motion, pressure, strain, uh, temperature, uh, as well as humidity sensor. Okay, so just to conclude is that while mechanical energy harvesters that I've just talked about can be used as power source, yeah, uh, alone uh, to help with the energy crisis, as I mentioned before, they can certainly be incorporated in closing uh, towards self-powered sensors. So the energy harvested, you just use it um, as sensors, that's that's all you need. Yeah, uh, and this sensor can be used for multiple applications. Um, as I mentioned before, if you were to to measure uh, the performance of a patient, uh, a performance that have hand or arm injury, and their ability to uh, bend their elbow, then you can use it for healthcare applications. Yeah, bending their fingers, etc. Um, so healthcare or biomedical applications in general, these kind of sensors. Now, future work require not only the energy harvesting and also and the sensing uh, concept, uh, but it, it would be good also to have a storage because remember, if you don't have a storage component and if the energy input is not sufficient to power the sensor, then you need to have a, an element of energy storage. Uh, ideally, you should come. Uh, you should add this to what we did before, uh, especially in the work of self-cleaning. So you have a, you can combine the sensing with the self-cleaning function again toward the concept of sustainability. Because again, the self-cleaning is something that doesn't require uh, to put it in washing machine. So therefore, you can save uh, plenty of electricity as well as water consumption in that concept. So combining these effects together, so I'm just trying to link what we're doing now, what I'm presenting today to our earlier work on self-cleaning, uh, as well as some recent work also on the uh, self-thermally regulating. So something something that can make you feel cool in, in summer, make you feel warm in winter. 
Uh, that is something we have done for a separate, so for a certain industry. Uh, but that's basically all about it. Combining all this uh, effect, I think toward the future, I think we will have less reliance on fossil fuel. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe, Professor Dao, I have uh, maybe two questions. Uh, about the ionic devices, uh, you highlight the feature of a resistive part and also capacitive part. Do you expect these such a devices will have a dynamic response, high frequency signals? Yeah, you are correct. Uh, because um, for innocence, let's take about uh, talk about finger bend bending. And uh, depending on the frequency of how how many times you can do finger bending, that that affects the. It becomes more complex, but if we if we stay within low frequency region, uh, then the performance is stable. Uh, for innocence, uh, if the, let's uh, talk about a, a stroke patient, for instance, and we try to measure their ability uh, to bend their finger, it will certainly be very slow. And to do it repeatedly, it will be very, very slow uh, compared with a, a healthy uh, subject. So yeah, so I think uh, I think the the impact of frequency at a, in the higher range of frequency that what we didn't look at we mainly look at the lower fre frequency range, such as waves uh, for marine energy harvesting. They're all in the low frequency range in terms of mechanical input. Yeah, I can see the ionic devices have this major problem in terms of modeling. Uh, instead of using resistance or capacitance, they should use a complex impedance uh, to do the modeling. Mm -hmm. okay. That will describe the device better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. About what area. Mm. It's a new uh, field. Many things need to be developed, I think. Uh, that's the first thing. But the, the, the ionic geo system. And if using that, will be uh, measuring definitely is no good uh, because uh, they. Hmm. Because uh, you did some value, because a uh, uh, mm -hmm. box. What for this? Um, there was a paper uh, that uh, reported very high power density. Mm. Uh, that used cellulose. Mm. Uh, it was an ionic conductor. Uh, it was both a solid state device, mm. uh, not semi solid. And that was 300 watt per meter square. But that is the highest I have seen. Mm. Mm. Uh, and didn't involve ionic uh, uh, conductors either, that particular piece of work. Uh, but so I, I'm not sure how far we can go, but I believe what we can push this to. Uh, is in the range of 10 to 20 watt, a bit based on ionic conductors, uh, not using metals, or inorganic or other mm. substances. I think we can push it to our, um, to maybe 20 watt at most. In your energy density, is it's a peak. We always uh, we always base based on, based on peak. Yeah, we always fix the frequency. We always fix the input, uh, the force, uh, and then measure, compare the devices to one another. 
based on peak. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any other questions from? Yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a small question. It's about the effect of the layer thickness uh, on the output performance and how how do you uh, optimize your layer thickness for this works? That's, that's a good point. Um, what, what, one of the things that I always thought it will have an impact on the dielectric properties, especially for the tri-book work, um, was the thickness. Yeah. I, I, I thought that they will have big impact. But it turned out to be, um, I think we reported the thickness. Uh, I'm just trying to think. I think one in some of the slides we have the thickness measured. Like uh, here, I think the thickness was reported. I, I mean, shown in the slide. But uh, in, 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 in general observation, just as a general observation, we didn't see big impact on thickness uh, on the dielectric properties of the substance. OK, OK, thank you. Ah, you don't need microphone. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, last week you mentioned a material of light. Uh, I'm wondering uh, what, uh, what type of polymer is that material? Because of light. Uh, I believe it's a kind of a PDMS. I believe it's siloxane. Uh, it's just that a, a commercial type of uh, siloxane where you have to buy two components. One is the monomer and the other is the cross-linker. And you mix the two A and B together, you form the film. Uh, but in terms of, I believe it's a siloxane polymer. To uh, collect energy by increasing the, the gradient uh, density and the energy of the membrane. Mm. So, do you think the sensor combined with the energy having the uh, function better in the, the, the energy of the device? Yeah, um, the concept of using hydrogel. Uh, is to make it a flexible, or we didn't make them stretchable yet, but at least for making them flexible, uh, so that we don't rely on solid state, uh, and that goes not only for not only for the for the active material, but also for the can collector too. That was the main concept for using hydrogel, but uh, when it comes to stretchability. We had to go to an uh, an elastomer, uh, a conventional elastomer. Uh, it just had been modified with uh, ionic liquid to make it ionic conductive. Uh, you have uh, introduced several systems. Uh, do you think it is possible to, <laughs> to 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 scale up or to yeah, even to develop some products? Yeah, um, I think. Uh, if if you if if low power density is not an issue, like the this work, obviously it can be scaled because it's made on based in, be, purely based on fabric, um, already made fabric. Uh, in terms of uh, this particular work, where we got close to three watts per uh, square meter, this particular work is essentially we tried to scale it. So instead of a three by three cm device. We made 10 by 10, and we can also make it on different substrates, like for in, the, in particular here in glass. Um, and we, we measure the output. Obviously, the output scales with the size of the device. So this particular um, hydrogel, um, but of course, if you, can, if, you, if you only rely on it as a current collector, that will serve the purpose. Uh, but if you wanted to flexible, then obviously glass wouldn't be the ideal substrate. But in terms of scal scalability, this has a high potential. You're welcome. 